All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for coming. My name is Farah Ahmed, Environmental Health Officer with the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. So we wanted to hold this information session today just to let the community know that uh, KDHE will be in the area over the next few weeks. Uh, we'll be conducting an investigation into a number of elevated blood lead cases among children in Saline County, so throughout the whole county. Uh, today, I just wanted to come to you with some background information, some who, what, where, when, why of what we're doing. Um, after I go through all of that background information, then we'll go ahead and open it up to the community, to residents, to ask any questions that you might have about what's going on. Um, I've got representatives with me today from KDHE Bureau of Air, Bureau of Water, Family Health, as well as the Saline County Local Health Department. So we will try to answer whatever questions you have. Anything we don't know today, uh, we will try to track down the answers and get back with you. KDHE, the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, is leading this investigation. We are working closely with partners at, the, um, at Children's Mercy Hospital in the Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit. Uh, we are also working with Saline County as well as the Saline County Health Department. What we're going to be doing is conducting in-depth investigations of 32 children between January 1st, 2015 and March uh, 31st, 2016. So any child that we've identified with an elevated blood lead test, we'll be investigating. So this is throughout the whole county. So just a little bit of background information about lead. Uh, it is found a good amount of the lead that we find in our environment is from man-made activities. So burning fossil fuels, um, from manufacturing, from mining activities. So the majority of lead exposures in children in the U.S. Um, does come from lead-based paint in those older homes. The majority of lead exposure in adults does come from uh, work-related activities. So the investigation is going to include in-depth one-on-one um, -on -one interviews with the affected families. Uh, we have contacted the families, but we are not making public who they are. Um, we'll sit down and do in-depth investigation and talk to them about all of the potential sources where their child could have been exposed to lead. So we'll talk about um, the age of the house, you know, is there lead-based paint in the house, is there lead-based paint in maybe a house that the child spends a good amount of time in, grandparents' house, maybe a daycare. Uh, we'll talk about any toys that might have lead-based paint on them, um, the use of foods or supplements, especially cosmetics that come from foreign countries, India, China, Mexico, um, can contain lead. We will be asking questions about the use of lead glazed pottery, for example, for storing food and heating up food. We will be asking about parents' occupations to see you know, if they work in an occupation where they're exposed to lead, they might be bringing it home on their skin or their clothes or their shoes. Uh, we'll also be asking about hobbies. So if someone in the house has a hobby where you know, they're using lead, they're making lead bullets or fishing lure or using lead solder for projects, uh, that's also a potential source. So it's, it's in-depth because we go through all of these potential sources of exposure. We are not going into the investigations with any kind of assumptions as far as what the exposures would be. We're really looking at this on an individual case by case, child by child uh, basis to try to figure out for that child where is that lead exposure coming from. And um, for, for our investigation to be really successful, we need participation from the affected families. We need, you know, hopefully 100% participation to help us figure out where it's coming from. Even if you think that you already know what the source of your child's lead exposure is, I, I would still ask that you participate because there could be an additional source that's adding to the problem. 
So in, in addition to those in-depth interviews, we're also going to be doing wipe sampling, um, which is actually taking samples um, inside the house looking for lead dust and lead contamination on surfaces. Uh, we may also do soil sampling near the home, so in yards, particularly in areas where the kids would play. So we might be doing that. And we will also be um, taking finished drinking water samples. And so what that is, is um, sampling the water that's actually coming out of your pipe that you drink and you cook with. And so in the last week of June, first week of July, you'll start to see Kansas Department of Health and Environment staff. Uh, they will go out to the affected families' homes, uh, drop off the sampling containers, drop off instructions on how to uh, take the water samples. Then KDHE staff will loop back around and pick it up and drop it off at the lab for analysis. So as previously mentioned, uh, we are investigating 32 cases. Uh, this is across Saline County. Uh, not surprisingly, the majority of the cases are in Salina. Um, not surprising because that's where the majority of the kids are. Uh, we did take a look to see if maybe physicians were um, testing in a particular part of town. Our testing data seems to show that that's not the case. Physicians are pretty evenly testing across town. Uh, we did take a look to see if all of the elevated cases were maybe um, all concentrated in one area. Again, that doesn't seem to be the case. They seem to be you know, spread out, so we'll be sp spread out in our investigation. We're hoping to get all of the uh, interviews, the in-depth interviews scheduled for the last three weeks in July. Uh, if we contact you at, uh, to set up an interview, we will be available mornings, afternoons, evenings, uh, weekends, whatever works for you. Again, in order for this to be a successful interview, uh, we've really tried to get 100% participation. So whenever you can make the time, we will be there. Um, all of the information that is gathered during the interviews is patient information. It is confidential patient information and will not be shared with anyone else. Um, we other than the local health department who will help with the investigation. Families um, of the children with elevated blood lead will get individualized reports back um, telling you, okay, this is our conclusion as far as this is where your child's lead exposure is likely to be coming from. And again, it could be more than one source. Um, once all of the interviews are done and all of the sample results are in and everything's done and analyzed, there will be a larger summary report uh, which will be made publicly available. So we're doing these investigations now because we've, we have identified that there are a number of children in Saline County uh, that have elevated blood leads and you know an in-depth intervie interview, an in-depth investigation hasn't been done so far. And so that's the reason that we're doing this. Um, there is no safe level of lead in a child. And so the only way to work on bringing those lead exposures down is to figure out where it's coming from. And although we will be focusing on these 32 children that we've identified, we do want to generally encourage parents, if you, if you haven't had your child screened for lead, um, please consider doing so particularly if you know, you've got one of those risk factors of living in an older home or you know, using cosmetics or foods or supplements from foreign countries, you've got lead glazed pottery that you use for cooking, any of those risk factors we kind of talked about, those potential sources of exposure, um, please consider having your child screened. I would also encourage any woman who is pregnant or is thinking about getting pregnant to please consider, again, if you've got these potential exposures, getting yourself screened because you can actually pass any lead that's in your body on to your baby while you're pregnant and also um, during breastfeeding. So the Saline County Health Department is going to be providing free lead screenings June 22nd and 23rd, so over the next two days. Uh, no appointments are necessary. 
So all adults and children six months and older, uh, you can just go in and the screening itself is actually very quick. So again, I'd really encourage you if you haven't had a screening to please think about doing that. And it's, it's no charge to you. A little bit more about why it's important. Why do we care about lead exposure? Um, how does it get into your system? There are three main ways. Uh, the, the major way that it's going to get into a child or an adult is through ingestion. So eating contaminated uh, food, water, eating paint chips, uh, that kind of thing. In general, um, children absorb a lot more of the lead that they ingest into into their bodies. So an adult and a child, they might ingest the same amount, but a child is actually going to absorb 50% of what they ingest. So that's why they're particularly vulnerable. So you can actually breathe in uh, lead contaminated dust or fumes. Um, some of the lead, so if you're breathing in lead, then that lead is actually going to quickly move into your blood and then move on to soft tissues and organs. Um, larger particles, if you're breathing that in, you could actually, you know, cough it up and then swallow it that way. The, the last kind of way you could be exposed is through Exposure. dermal, so actually absorbing it through the skin, although that is actually very rare. So if you're touching uh, lead contaminated dust or soil, um, a small amount of that can be absorbed through your skin, especially if you've got cuts and scrapes. Um, more than likely, if you've got contamination on your hands, what's going to happen is you're going to get it on food or, you know, your chapstick or whatever, and then you end up ingesting it that way. So once lead gets into the body, it travels, um, it gets into your blood, then it kind of moves into the moves, soft tissue uh, in your organs. So liver, kidney, lungs, brain, spleen, uh, your muscles, your heart, it goes everywhere. Um, and then after several weeks, it's going to move into your bones and your teeth. So about 73% of uh, lead in children's body is actually stored in their bones. Um, and that stays for decades. And in and, and times of high bone stress, so if a child breaks a bone or later on in life, during pregnancy or uh, during uh, lactation, that lead is actually leaching out of their bones and recirculates in the blood. Um, we talked about how children absorb a lot more of that lead into their system, and that's because they, they are actually um, not able to eliminate the lead as, as well as adults. So about 32% um, of the lead that goes in comes out as waste, but the rest of that is being absorbed into their bones. If you are exposed to lead, uh, there's a number of factors that are going to determine whether or not you, there are symptoms or health effects. Um, part of that is going to depend on the dose, so that's how much you actually get. You know, do you get a little bit? Do you get a lot? Um, it's going to depend on duration. So did you get all of your um, exposure in a short burst, or did, was it kind of long and stretched out? Um, how you were exposed is going to affect it. So you know, was it ingestion, which is going to be absorbed a lot more versus uh, dermal? So all of those factors, plus there are individual factors. You know, just a person's age, their genetics, their general health, their diet, all of those things are going to um, affect whether or not there are health effects. Um, in general, the, the health effects for lead exposure in children include slowed growth, a lower IQs, uh, uh, learning difficulties, including behavioral issues, um, and anemia, which is low iron in the blood. For adults, uh, it, it goes more towards cardiovascular, like issues with the heart and with kidneys. Uh, children are especially vulnerable um, because they're they're considered a, a high risk population. So just think about, you know, they're still in this, this their stage of their lives developing, and so that's why they're particularly vulnerable to lead exposure. Um, as we talked about, they generally absorb more uh, than adults do. 
Uh, they have different diets. So consider a baby who is maybe on formula made with contaminated water and that's all they eat versus an adult who might ingest contaminated water but it's part of a whole diet of everything else. So again, that's, that's why children are more vulnerable than adults. They have longer lifespans, so if you're exposed as a child, then there's you know, many, many more years for that lead to you know, get into the bones and then cause health effects versus an adult who might just be exposed later in life. And kids have generally high-risk behaviors. You know, they're, they're picking up dirt and putting it in their mouths, and they're picking up dirty toys and putting it in their mouths and eating wood, you know, paint chips. These are not things that adults do, so that's why kids are just generally more vulnerable. So in, in summary, KDHE, as well as our partners, will be in the area during July. Uh, we're going to be investigating the elevated blood lead cases. Again, I'm going to make this appeal, you know, how good of a job that we do really depends on participation by the affected families um, so that we can get the information and work together to figure out what the source is. Uh, again, the families will receive individual reports about what the source was for their child or children. And then there will be that larger summary report that will be available for everyone. And that summary report will say, you know, as a group, the majority of the exposure was coming from this. And these are the recommendations for intervention so that, you know, whoever different partners have that information in their hands and say, okay, to make the biggest impact, this is what, you know, we need to focus on. I will take questions in a second. I, one, one last thing. Um, I know that um, even though we are focusing on these, you know, these families, in particular, if you want to ask any questions as far as um, having, and the question about getting your water tested is probably going to come up, and we do have an answer for you. I'm just going to let you know. So, let's see. I think I will open it up to I'd really questions. like to entertain questions from the residents, from the community. Um, let's keep it to 30 minutes or so, maybe. Um, if you are media and you have questions, we've got two public information officers here, and so I would really encourage you to talk to them. Ashton and Cassie, right there. You can talk to them after. You can talk to them now, out back, whatever you want to do. But like I said, I want to get the questions answered from the residents. So we've got a mic here, we've got a mic there, and like I said, we've got representatives from different KDHE bureaus. So. Hi, my question is, if new cases come up, are you going to investigate and interview those new families and new cases? Good question. Right now, like I said, we are, it depends. If new cases come up during which time period? So from the lead Like screen, within this, this next week. Like if I, once this came up, my, my son has delayed speech, so I went ahead and had my children tested. Right. We live in an older home. My husband works in a factory. Right. You know, we have the risk factors. Yes. So if, if, we, if more cases are identified or if for some reason uh, you know that you have a child with an elevated blood lead but we didn't contact you, please contact us. We will go ahead and get you scheduled in. If new cases come up after we're done with all of the interviews in July, we'll need to make a plan at that point. But if, if they come up while we're scheduling, then yeah. Any other questions? When you say uh, testing the water, now you will test it in different parts of the community and uh, at the end, uh, such as schools, the drinking fountains. Uh, I'm, I'm not so much concerned at the water treatment plant, what's coming out, but at the end point, the uh, homes, you've got a lot of different pipes being put in. Uh, with the lab going through that, I'm more concerned about the uh, lab at the end point of the schools and different. Right. So we're, we're definitely testing the finished drinking water for the families we know have kids with elevated blood leads. And then I will toss it to our Bureau of Water to talk about. If you, um, we're up here. So if you, 
want to have your water tested or the schools tested, um, what we are advising those that are interested is to contact the city of Salina and coordinate the testing um, with the city if you're not one of the families that has been contacted by KDHE. The families that are contacted, we are doing the sampling. Um, those that have not been contacted, uh, the city of Salina has graciously agreed to, to work with their customers um, to try and get testing done. Um, we would recommend, if it's the school district, that the school district work directly with the city of Salina. If a group of people, and I don't know what it costs, is that a testing that cost and it's what approximately what it costs if you've got a group of people that they'll make, uh, that have different schools test it, how can we coordinate that and put that together? I would direct you to the school district and let the school district and the city of Salina um, coordinate your efforts. Are there other questions? Yeah. Okay, I, I can hear you. I have a question. So, how is this going to affect our breastfeeding moms in this community who know that their children have been exposed to lead? Like, you won't test under six months. How do we know that our babies don't have this issue? How are we going to address that? That's a huge concern for me. So the, the lead screening that, that the uh, local health department is offering over the next two days, um, it's the reason that they won't test anyone under six months is just because of the type of test. It is a quick finger prick capillary test. If you are concerned about your baby and would like them tested, you, um, I would recommend that you go to your physician, to the pediatrician, and have them test. They will actually need to do a venous sample, which is a draw from the vein, and then send it off to a lab. But it's just the type of testing that they're offering tomorrow. It's not recommended for babies. Yes? So you said you can get it from inhalation. So if you drive around this town and there are homes that are in bad need of painting, and the, many of these homes are down to a bare wood. So all the original paint is no longer on this home. That means it's getting into the ground. And so when the wind blows, is that then paint dust blowing? If my neighbor's house is, is in bad need of paint, is it possible that we're inhaling paint fumes and lead paint fumes? So it would it would have to be lead. So it would have to be the chipping paint is you know pulverized and it's actually lead containing dust. So if there, and and I have no idea what the background kind of air quality as far as um, what you're talking about would be, but if if theoretically, like for example, if you're renovating a house and you're sanding off lead-based paint and you're, you know, you're not wearing personal protective equipment and you're breathing it in, then yes, that is, that is a way to get exposed. Okay. And so if, if yeah, uh, I'm sorry, I think someone from AIR does have something to say. Yes, I would. Uh, a couple of things in regards to uh, in, in regards to lead transport via air. Uh, to answer uh, one of your questions specifically, we have actually uh, done uh, background sampling, background air sampling in in uh, Salina. Uh, in regards to lead, I I do not have those numbers at my fingertips right now, but I can certainly get them uh, for you if you would uh, if you would just get me your information, I can get that. The other thing that I would say in regards to transport of the lead, uh, lead, <coughs> probably most of you are aware, lead is a very is very heavy. And uh, thus, it does not it does not transport easily in the air. So, even uh, even a hundred, uh, two hundred feet makes a a huge difference in regards to the concentration of the uh, of the lead that would be uh, 
that would be airborne at that point because it falls out so very quickly because it is so heavy. So if you have um, people who have older homes, what is the best way to preventing for people exposing themselves to lead? As, so if you're you're talking about if you live in an older home that you know has lead-based paint right now? Well, I mean, what's going to happen when you do the investigations? Or is are we going? Is the health department going to be coming to people's homes and making sure? And so part of the investigation will be to look, like I said, we're going to do those wipe samples, which will look to, for lead contamination on surfaces. We will be looking at the age of home and looking for the condition to see if there's peeling paint, um, particularly around window sills or low areas where kids can get at. Uh, that's all part of the investigation. We will be looking at the condition on the outside of the house as well. And, and so for older homes, what is the way of preventing? Right, and that I will hand over to David Hart. So KDHE um, does license um, abatement. Go ahead. Yeah, we have what's called the Renovate, Repair, and Paint Rule. Um, it's been in place since April of 2010. So if you're hiring a contractor to do the work on your home, say scraping and painting, they have rules and regulations through the state of Kansas they have to abide by. So if you hire somebody to do that kind of work, You'll want to verify with them they are certified and licensed properly through KDHE. If you're doing the work yourself, we have brochures <clears throat> that we can send to you. We also have uh, a lot of information on our website, which is kshealthyhomes.org, and it talks about things you can do to prevent exposure in your own home, especially if you're doing any kind of remodeling or rehab. And we actually have booklets out we have a bunch of materials out in the two tables in the lobby, but one of them is a booklet about renovating right. Thank you. Yes. Uh, considering the amount of factories we have in our community, uh, especially since one of them is the battery manufacturer, who has, I know, been under investigation for lead contamination in the past, is that something you're going to be looking into? From, from my perspective, uh, we will be looking at, like I said, the take-home lead issue. So not just the battery manufacturing plant, but all kind of industries, all of the um, kind of work sites here in Salina where parents might be working, gun ranges, you know, you have potential exposure there and you could be bringing it to home. So I'm going to be looking at it from that perspective. And I think Rick can speak to the, your specific questions about Exide. Right. Yep. The uh, the largest source of of uh, air pollution in regard and uh, just to be clear, cri criteria pollutants are uh, are the ones that are regulated by by KDHE, and lead is a. Uh, uh, and uh, lead is or does fall under that category. In such a case, we were uh, we were required to do a couple of things. Number one, we were required to uh, to permit any site that is a uh, that is a major source of lead, which is by definition it is in excess of 10 tons per year, or if it is less than 10 tons, they would be a minor source of. Uh, of lead if they if they have lead emissions the other thing uh, so we are monitoring certainly the uh, certainly the emissions from Exide and secondly uh, we have lead samplers out uh, if sampling for lead in ambient air in that particular area because the uh, the area was found upon uh, it was uh, back in uh, 2008 when EPA lowered the standard EPA lowered the standard from from uh, 1.5 to uh, 0.15 so they uh, lowered it by a factor of 110 and we have been monitoring that site. Uh, I'm tr try to get a date for you here. We have been monitoring at that site since 2010. 
the standard for lead says uh, the the national ambient air quality standard for lead states that the the monitor must be at less than 0.15 and it utilizes a three-month rolling average. So uh, January, February, and March would be together. February, March, and April would be together. So, and it, and it just continues on. And what we are required to have happen is that we have to have three years of consecutive data of the three-month rolling averages below 0.15 in order to uh, in order to be in compliance with the national ambient air quality standards right now i can tell you there were some major modifications to the excite plant that were put on as a result of well a, num a number of things they're wanting to improve their plant certainly but the lowering of the but the lowering of the national ambient air quality standard uh, played a role in this too. I can tell you that in approximately about a six month period of time, if things continue on, we will have uh, at those monitors three years of continual of continual readings of below 0.15. Uh, we have about six months to go, uh, so it has been about, uh, it has been a little over two and a half years ago since we have seen a violation at that monitor. And, uh, and then, but once you get that, once you get that violation, you start from ground zero. So you start with, uh, so you start from that date and, and you have three years to obtain clean data. So again, we have a, we have a, uh, uh, a good series of of sample or of uh, monitoring going, and uh, and we continue to have those monitors in in place as well. Uh, did that answer your question? I hope. Okay, ter terrific. Thank you. Good. Your speech is air. Are you, how about the water? Any baffled? Uh, they're baffled. The uh, uh, cleansing of, of what they release into the water. Do you have any estimates on that? I'm not sure I heard the complete question. So are you talking about the in, industrial processes releasing lead into the water? Of the lead released from Exide into the water. So, uh, I, I, I have no idea. Are you monitoring that? I'm, I am not aware. Of, you know, we don't, the public water supply section, uh, Exide doesn't monitor for that from uh, from our perspective, so I I don't know. I don't. So the, it, it, they were they had inadequate back backfilling. Um, more people would ingest the water than the air quality. Is that okay? So so when we sample for lead in drinking water they are finished water samples coming out of your household tap so it's water that has been withdrawn from salinas wells treated at salinas water treatment plant um, they use corrosion control they do routine monitoring for both lead and copper and, and those samples um, for their routine monitoring indicate there is no elevated lead in the drinking water. So I'm, there would have to be some sort of a cross connection or some kind of problem at the Excite plant. And I'm sure that, that the city of Salina uh, monitors to make sure there is no backflow or cross connection from Excite into their distribution system for their drinking water. So the two things would be separate. The two sources would be separate. I don't know if that answered your question or not, but. You said the uh, city, you were sure that the city monitored that? Do they have an actual record of the dates and times that they monitor this stuff? Yes, and it's, it's posted. And actually, um, the results are posted on the KDHE Public Water Supply website. And the application is called Drinking Water Watch. 
and you can go on and look at any public water supply in the state of Kansas and look at all of their monitoring data, all the results, um, lead and, and everything else they monitor for as well. Are there any other? Yes. Uh, I was just wondering if you could speak to um, the number of other children that were tested that were negative or trends over time this year compared to last year. Do you have data like that? Sure. I do have data like that. Uh, okay. So, um, so we, so this is preliminary data, and the reason that it's preliminary is because um, we've got a number of, we've got a number of cases where we don't have an address, where we have completely missing address information. You know, physician doesn't send it to lab or lab doesn't send it to us. And so as we track down those missing addresses by either calling physician or looking up, you know, different databases trying to find those kids, um, some of these numbers can change. But these are the numbers for the county for the last three years. Again, preliminary numbers. Those are to a high elevated level? These are... Um, children ages 0 to 15 years with levels of 5 micrograms per deciliter or greater. So these are individual children, individual cases. Yes? Um, definitely welcome your intervention, but my question is, um, with our child, she tested high a year ago. Why have we waited a year for the intervention? That's a good Because we had the understanding from the physician that this is just something that we need um, like I said, the reason that we're doing these in-depth investigations now, because we've gotten to a, a point where we recognize there's a number of cases throughout the county, and these in-depth kind of interviews haven't been done, or you know, we could we just need to do a better job of helping the families figure out what the source is. Um, we at KDHE. All test results for kids that are five and greater um, go into our system and we watch them. Essentially, if they're between five and nine micrograms per deciliter, um, we just kind of keep an eye on them at the state and make sure that it's not an elevating kind of going up trend. Uh, we work, uh, if physicians call us or if parents call us, we kind of work with them, give them some educational materials to try to guide them in the right direction of figuring out uh, where that lead exposure might be coming from. Uh, once it is a 10 micrograms per deciliter and above, uh, we route it to the local health department. And local health departments, it, it varies from county to county, but uh, we ask them to reach out to the families, give them educational materials, talk to them about kind of the more common sources of lead exposure to see if uh, they can help parents figure out where it's coming from. We also ask them to reach out to the providers, so the physician who's managing uh, the child, um, to again give them some educational materials. We've also got some medical management guidelines that you, for physicians, like if you have a child that's in this range, uh, we want to, you to retest in this amount of time. Uh, we also put physicians in contact with um, our partners at Children's Mercy Hospital uh, if they want to do a medical consultation physician to physician. So that's what we do at the state, and I can, I can toss it over to Jason Tiller with the local health department. He can tell you specifically what goes on here. So once we receive the um, information about a child that has had an elevated blood lead that is greater than 10 through the, our EpiTrack system, which is a state system, um, Joyce, our lead case manager, uh, then starts looking at filling in whatever those blanks are and contacting the family. Um, from that point, then working with physicians, and our main role at present is <clears throat> in the case management of those uh, those cases, and that can vary from child to child depending on levels and situations and, and any other information that's provided. Um, and then from there, uh, working the uh, either a treatment plan or um, whatever other steps that need to be determined from that point. 
we don't have, like Mills counties right now, the funding or the resources for uh, doing the lead testing in the homes. Um, but that may be something down the line as um, one of the staff from environmental health and planning and zoning has been working on some credentialing uh, that we can, that will be able to help with that. But until that is complete, Rick here is pretty much the only one that can do the, the wipes and the very in-depth testing for uh, lead that will be going on during the investigation. David. David. Sorry, <laughs> David. Yes. Were these tests done randomly or was it a geographic area that was tested or is this just the kids went into the doctor? just the kids went into their doctors. So uh, we at the state uh, receive all blood lead test results for Kansas residents. So if you're a Kansas resident and you get tested, um, the laboratory is required by law to send us a copy of that lab. And that's, that's how we. Is that a routine test they do? Um, it depends. It, you know, it really depends on who the child and what the physician feels. So some physicians will routinely test. Um, some physicians will routinely test because of Medicaid requirements. Um, some physicians will do kind of like a background and assess if you've got potential risk factors and then test. Um, some parents will just ask for it. So it's a variety. Kansas is not. Uh, what is called a universal testing state. There are states that generally require that all kids be tested by a certain um, age, and Kansas does not. Can we pinpoint it to the city or county, any, any location? Like say, are all the kids within the city zoning, or is it out in the county? Do we know that? Um, there, there are uh, cases throughout the whole county, so we're so we're not just focusing on um, Salina. We are looking at cases outside of Salina. Um, like I said, the majority of the cases happen to be here because this is you know you've got a lot of kids here. I guess the 25, the 25 that we're talking about is whatever 30, 32. Uh, I, I'm just interested whether it's on the city system or whether it would be in a in a Rule Are you talking about water? Yes. Oh, they, they would be on both, but the majority would be on the city system. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's what I mean. You, you yeah. can actually pinpoint to the city system. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. I have one that the last reading was lower, but it's still high. If we have not contacted you, just after this meeting, just come up and give me your contact information. Um, there, there are a, a small number that we haven't been able to track down phone numbers for. So if that's the case, if you know that you have a child, or if you want me to just go back and look to see if your child should have been included, um, just please come up and give me your contact information. I'll look it up. And then on that. With her level dropping just a little bit, could it be that it's being absorbed into her phone and not showing up on the, the, lead, the blood test? Likely, likely, if her levels are dropping, that means um, somehow or another you've you've stopped that exposure. So she is not ingesting it more than likely whatever she was ingesting. Um, so you've you've put a barrier between her and whatever it was that was exposing her. numbers that you have up here, um, are they tested every year then? Again, we don't. Tested once and then you test another random 30? No, so we don't, we don't test. So we at the state do not require any testing. And that's actually a good point because, so these are the number of for each of those years, but they are not necessarily, so you could have the same child in 2013 and 2014 and 2015. So if that child's level never dropped before be below five, then they would have been included in each of those years. Or we could also have 100 kids instead of 32. And why was this not important in 2014 when there were 38? 
why would you have 100 kids over? We well, don't add it all up. You've got 30 oh. now, 38, 21, and 25. That's over 100. No. At this point, right now, at this point in time, well, at the end of 2015, we had 25 total. Plus the 38 plus the 21 if yeah. they weren't retested. Because you said earlier right. that their levels right. if, always drop. Right. So, so those 38 kids from 2014 still have high blood 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 in 2015. So add the 38 with the 25. Okay, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. So if a child if then? if a child was tested in 2014 and was elevated but never retested in 2015, they would not show up in the 2015 numbers. So why did we have a group like this in 2014 when we had 38 and now we have 32 more? Right. And like I said, we're we're acknowledging now that these in-depth investigations had not been done. I think Jason mentioned that you know the resources they did what they could with the resources at the local health department we've gotten to a point we recognize that there's 32 ki kids throughout the county that we can just do a better job of going and figuring out what it is that um, that the sources of exposure are and that's what we're doing not that it wasn't important in 2014 yes uh, I guess this is um, more directed towards Jason from the health department. Um, I know that the medical card requires kids from the ages of, I believe, at 12 months and 24 months to receive a blood lead level with their can be healthy. That is correct. Um, and we do not always get those done um, as they reach two years old. The health department is going to do blood lead testing for the next two days, which you guys do not do that anymore. Is that, do you see that changing in the future? Uh, up to this point, or at least in the last year or so, we hadn't been doing lead testing, partially because of the lack of funding for that. Um, and it was being done for most of the kids through their Can Be Healthy screens or at their doctor's office. Um, at this point, we are doing it for the next two days. And after that, depending on um, how many people we have that come in and, and utilize that, um, and then through any other information that's gained during the investigation, uh, we'll be determining if that's something that we'll be able to continue um, and if it's feasible for us to be able to continue that or what other alternative actions there will be. I just pulled test results from January 1st of that year to December 31st of that year. And, you know, some kids have multiple test results. You, you deduplicate. And, uh, did you say January 1st to March of 2016 there were 32 children? January 1st, 2015 through March 31st, 2016. So all of 2015 plus the first three months of 2016. That's what we're focusing on. Yeah. yeah. OK, I'm going to take maybe three more questions, and then I, I will stay afterwards and make myself available if you've got additional questions. But um, OK. Go ahead. Uh, how do those numbers compare to other cities and some of the So um, to answer your question, Celine, these are these are counties. These are not cities. These are counties. Um, Celine County is not the worst. It really isn't. Uh, if we're looking at, so if we're looking at it, it's probably in the top 30 percent of counties that have a number of kids. So that's why we want to go ahead and investigate. But if you were able to see this terrible graph, you would notice that there's a lot of counties that have zeros. And that doesn't mean that they don't have any kids with elevated blood lead levels. Sometimes we have counties that really their physicians don't screen. 
and your, your physicians do a great job of testing the kids. They really do. That's a good question. And that's why um, when I say I've got 2013, 14, and 15 preliminary numbers, the reason also that they're preliminary is when we get a test result that's five and greater for a child that immediately goes into the system that Jason mentioned called EpiTrax, um, everything else that is less than five, which is, which is the bulk, we get approximately 40,000 test results a year. And the vast majority of those are less than five. And we, we don't have the staff to do all the data entry on those. So they, they sit and they wait until the end of the year and they get shipped off to a company that does the data entry for parade. And all then of we have to include. So what I'm trying to say is I don't have the denominator data for you. So I can give you a website where we've got denominator data from 2000 to 2012. But as far as 13, 14, and 15 goes, I don't have that denominator data. I'm going to take one question. I just had a quick question about resources that are going to be available to families who do have those issues. I mean, you know, we, we work for a living. We can't have to move. We think that it's going to be out of, you know, out of the idea. Right. We can't have to move. My husband works a good job. He can't quit his job. Right. Right, and that's a really good question, and I think what we're doing here today is really just a first step. Um, we've got to figure out what the source or sources of the exposure are, and that way, once we, we've got that information and once all of the different partners who would be involved in making those types of decisions have that information, then we can focus on an intervention plan and who would take the lead. Um, so I can't stand up here and say, you know, that we, we'd be able to provide, you know, grants or anything like that. Again, we don't know what the source is. We've got to figure that out first. Lead does not naturally occur in drinking water in the state of Kansas. Lead gets into your drinking water through lead pipelines, um, lead in fixtures in the home. So there are things you can do within your home that can help protect you. So if you would happen to have a whole house water softener, sometimes using a water softener, um, even though the water coming in that's delivered from the city of Salina is treated for corrosion control, that water softener, if you have a whole house one, may make that water more corrosive to your in-home household fixtures. So that may, the source may be within your home. Uh, one of the things that you can do to, to help prevent um, lead is just turn your tap on cold and let it run for a little bit before you fill up your water glass or um, for cooking. Just let it run for a few seconds and on cold and, and don't use hot water out of your hot water tap for um, cooking. So start with cold water and then heat it up. And some of those things, look and see if you, if you rent, um, you might check with your landlord to see if you have a lead service line. Um, the city of Salina may know if there's a lead service line um, to your residence. But I would get rid of a water softener if you had one and just make sure you run cold water out of your tap for a few minutes before you use it. That helps just cut down on the amount of lead that might be coming into your system. So like I said, we've got a, a lot of good materials outside on the tables. Please feel free to grab like said, them I'll and um, we'll, be, we'll be here for a few minutes. So if you've got some questions that I know I, I can see I've missed somebody, you can just come on up and, and I'll try to get that answered.